Okay, good night, everybody. Welcome to lecture five of Intro to Backend. All of the official coding for the course is officially over. So, round of applause. Well, there's the hack challenge, but for the assignment wise, all the coding is over. So, yay. Okay, so a couple of quick announcements before we get into class. PA3 grades were released earlier today, so you can see those on CMS. PA4 is due this Wednesday. October 26th. And of course, as usual, office hours and ed can be found on our syllabus. So a quick co course overview of what we've done so far. We've covered routes, databases, relational databases, and abstractions. So basically, those four topics are all that you need for a core backend. What we'll be covering today is containerization and DevOps. So basically, you've done all this work, you have all this code written, now, how do you basically allow other users to use this code? So a quick review before we start containerization and DevOps. Last week, we touched on ORMs, object relational mappers. In this, in our case for PA4, we use SQL Alchemy. Um, so it uses objects and classes to interact with the database. So basically, Python objects, Python classes, it makes syntax much easier, coding much easier, um, just makes your life as a programmer much easier because the, the the RM is doing the hard work for you. You're not coding with raw SQL anymore. So translate SQL to Python and things are done at automatically for you, such as like um enforcing reference conditions and like joining tables, et cetera, et cetera. So moving on to the develop the deployment process. So we're going to talk about dev and prod environments. So the dev environment is short for development. This is the environment that engineers are actually coding. So the coding in. So the includes all like the debugging, the print statements, other logging, et cetera. This is what this is the environment that is actively being used as engineers write code and develop. Then there's the prod environment, which is short for which is short for the production environment. And this is the actual environment that the user or the consumer is going to interact with. So since like the actual consumer is going to be seeing this environment and using it, this has to be super clean, good style, no errors, no print statements, no nothing. It has to be like the best style possible because this is what the consumer, the customer is essentially going to be seeing. So dev and prod. Thus far, we've been working on dev and we're going to talk about prod a little later on. So. There are four steps to the deployment process, two of which we're going to focus on today. So the first one is compressing our code into the production environment. And again, the production environment is the environment that the other users, the consumer is going to use, will utilize, and then prepare the production environment to be run ready. So essentially making sure it's good style, very clean, no print statements, et cetera. Okay. Oh, also the slides are in the textbook, so you don't have to take notes. Like this is all available online. Um, so let's ask this question to ourselves. How do we run apps on other machines? Because thus far, we've been working on our own local servers. You write your code in app.py and db.py. You run it on Postman on your local server, your local laptop. So how do we run apps on other machines? AKA how do other users are able to use our apps? And before we answer that question, let's ask ourselves, why would we want to do such a thing in the first place? So in production, we do not want apps to be running off our local machines. So for example, if the Eatery app, like, you know, Eatery, everyone knows, for dining halls, say that's run on Shingo's server, like his laptop. And then Shingo goes to bed, closes his laptop, the server stops running, and then no one can now, no one can now access Eatery. That would not work well. So essentially, we want to be able other other people to run the servers so they're they're able so we basically don't want our apps running on local servers we want to use other servers and how do we get there in the first place let's ask another question what is in an environment so in an environment it's going to be your operating system the um that's going to be mac or windows depending on what computer you use their code which in this class that would be your db.py or your app.py um all the libraries, which contains all the specific tools that you need to run your code. So these specific libraries would be installed in when you run, when you pip install requirements.txt and your environment variables. 
we'll touch later on what an environment variable is specifically. So as I said, the operating system, the code, your libraries, and your environment variables. So environment variables is essentially a file containing basically con confidential information. Think of it kind of like a file with secrets. It contains sensitive information and you do not want it like readily available in your code base. So for example, two databases thus far we've used is SQLite 3 and another one called Postgres. And in order to use Postgres, you need to log in with a username and password. And in order to do this, you wouldn't want to just like push your code to GitHub and then everyone can see your login information for Postgres, like the username and password. It's super sensitive information. So instead, what you do is use an environment variable. And to do that, you define your variables in a local.env file, and then you would SSH into your server, essentially log into your server, and then create that same .env file. So here's an example. This is a login information for Postgres. You have your host, which is local host. You have the database that you want to log into. So in this case, it's the Ithaca Transit in Ithaca Transit database. You have your username, which would be SN685, Shingles.net ID, and then your password, super secure password. So instead of just having all of this information available in your source code, you would instead use a .env file, which stores your environment variables. And this would look something like this. You have your env file, and then it contains the relevant information. So you have your database, Ithaca Transit, your username, SN685, and your password, super secure password. So instead, it would go from something like that to the on the on the left to something like this. You have like databases, OS dot environment database. So you basically utilize your environment, your dot env file containing your environment variables to then log in a different way. So here's the what I touched on earlier. You have your dot your lo, your dot env file on your local computer, and then you would create this exact same file on your server. So basically, you only want the, e, the your environment variables um to those directly using the server, and it should not be public general information. So in this class, we've been taking a very small scale approach. Um, the setup for using our servers it's very simple. You install Python three. You install requirements.txt to install all your relevant libraries and tools. And then you run app.py. Very simple, three steps, nothing crazy. But say you want to um, work on a more complex app, like, for example, Ithaca Transit, There's um, it takes a lot more steps. Like, you might have to install a lot more um, software, a lot more um, libraries and tools. Like, it might not be as simple as a three-step process. So setup becomes a lot more cumbersome. So the solution to this would be you just want essentially you want a more modular and automated solution other than like basically doing the long list of setup yourself. So the old way of doing this would be virtualization, where essentially you would run a virtual machine on your computer. Um, does anybody know what a virtual machine is? Yes, it's um pretty pretty like common. It's basically running a computer on your computer. So say you have a Mac and you want to use Windows, you could like in install Boot Camp and then have like the Windows, um, the Windows framework on your computer and vice versa with Windows. It's basically a way to get a different operating system on your computer if you need. So here's an example of using a virtual machine to run apps. You basically have like three different apps all running on three different virtual machines with the relevant operating system and the relevant like setup. But again, since you have three virtual machines running separately, this is very resource inefficient and very time inefficient, very space inefficient. Basically it takes up a lot of time and space that you don't have as a developer. So the solution to this is something called containerization, um, where basically you compress code. We mentioned this um, earlier. You compress code into production environment and then prepare production environment to be <clears throat> run ready. So essentially you're putting your in, your application into a tiny com container and then sending it out for all to you for all users to then utilize on their own. So the first step is compressing code into a production environment, so our prod environment. 
And to do this, we use something called Docker. Docker is a cloud-based platform. So basically containerization is putting your app into a very tiny, neat container, container basically modularizing it. And it allows developers to package their software in a standard unit of software. And this is the standard user unit that all other users will then use on their own local devices. It builds codes into images, and then you run that image as a container. So we'll move on to like what images and running an image is, looks, what running an image looks like. So a Docker image, it's basically a blueprint for your app. So you build an image for your source code. So you define what you want your app to look like in a file called a Docker file, and then that creates your Docker image. And that's essentially the basic blueprint to what your, what you want your app to look like. So kind of think of like the Docker image as like a set of instructions to then run your app on a someone's like local device. And then a Docker container is the live instance of your app. So it's the a Docker container is the app actually running on someone's local device. So and then you run that container from your image. So just for comparisons, like an image to container. It's going to be like a class, a class, a Python class is like the basic instruction, like the basic blueprint for your class, a Python class to Python objects, your blueprint to your house, recipes to your cakes, and instructions to the production of this instruction. So the image is the blueprint, and the Docker container is the actual le real life live instance of your app. So here's a better, here's another diagram of like a better solution to running apps on someone's local environment, local server. So we have a, um, a user's like system. They have a Docker installed. And then on top of that, they have separate apps running. So basically Docker allows you, so instead of having to like install a virtual machine and then that has like the different OSs and et cetera, et cetera, you just install Docker and then Docker does all the work for you using those containerized applications. I know I've said a lot. Does anybody have any questions thus far? Okay, moving on. So what are the benefits of containerization? So as I've mentioned this far, um, it's just like a very simple and standardized way to deploy your apps. So it's a better application management system. It's a better, app better application management system, um, requires fewer resources, less time, less space. Um, you're able to boot up applications faster. And this is like the most important takeaway. It's a lot more simple and it allows for modularity. And step two in this process is prepare for the production environment to be production ready. So that comes back to basically, oh, this could come back to good style, writing good code, um, removing off print statements, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in Docker Hub, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like GitHub, where you know how GitHub you can push your code, your push your code to a service, and anybody can then download code from online. So basically, push code to Docker for, to GitHub, and then you can pull code from from GitHub. Um, Docker Hub is essentially the same thing, a very similar thing. So it's a cloud-based service. It's like based on the internet. You it stores images in private and public repositories. So the image again is basically like the blueprint, the instructions for building and running your app. So basically the code to the GitHub platform, it's the same comparison for an image to Docker Hub. And basically it's a necessary medium for remote servers to access pre-built images. So it's basically it's a way for people to access images, which is like the instructions for your app online. So here are the steps for um, Docker. Basically, you create your Docker file, which is like the basically the 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 setup, the basically what you're finding, what you want your app to be like. You then build your Docker image, which is the blueprint. You then push your image to Docker Hub. So then your blueprint is online, available for others to use. So you push your image online to Docker Hub, and then your others are then able to pull their in, pull your image from Docker Hub for their own use. So essentially like you have one whale and then that one whale becomes many whales. And then to explain like those many whales, you can have one application having um, a lot of basically 
many containers. So for example, an app like Ithaca Transit, it's very complicated. It involves like, for example, the map view, like seeing um, the local Ithaca area, the basically the distance calculator from like point A to point B, the route calculation of like what time the buses are coming, et cetera, et cetera. So an app like Ithaca Transit could have multiple containers. And there's something called Docker Compose, which is a tool for defining and running these multiple containers within one singular application. Um, this course, since it's into the backend, we're only going to be dealing with one, one container apps thus far. But just something to keep in mind that Docker Compose, you're able, it allows you to do deal with um, multi-container applications. So essentially you have like your cute little octopus and that cute little octopus is juggling several containers. Like you have, you might have like Python in one, like the different like um, applications. And then that all, that's all condensed into that one. <clears throat> so just a quick summary before Shingo gets into demo. We define a Docker file to specify apps required environment. So basically to, to, um, to quick refresher, the environment is going to contain the operating system, the necessary libraries, the code itself, which is like your app.py and your db.py and your environment variables, which is the super secret information you need to like log in to um, a necessary server if that's necessary. So you define the Docker file, which contains like the relevant information for building your application. You build the Docker image from this Docker file, which is essentially building that blueprint, building that set of instructions for your application. You then push your image to Docker Hub. You're basically pushing your image, your set of instructions online for others to see and later on use. And then you define how to run your images in a Docker Compose file. So basically Docker Compose like tells you how to run your images itself to then make your Docker container which is the live real life, like the, the live real life instance of your application. Um, before we get into demo, we're going to touch on DevOps. DevOps stands for development operations. And basically it's just like a, um, it's a section of the tech world, which deals with like how to efficiently um, release software. So basically like the dev a part of DevOps is development. So building the software itself. So that's what we've been doing thus far. And then operations deals with like testing and releasing the software itself for others to then later on use. So DevOps is basically the combination of this. It's the development and operations, like the development, creation, operations, testing, and release of this software. And the goal of DevOps, like the field of Dev DevOps, is to basically do this in a quick, clean, reliable fashion, essentially. And just makes this process of like development and um, development operations as like quick and clean and seamless as possible. And this is like a little image to show that like you have your little flow, you have like the package, release, configure, monitor. So it starts with plan really. Well, you think it starts with plan. So like you plan it, you create it, you verify it, you package it, you then release it, configure, monitor, et cetera. And that cycle continues on and on. So this basically embodies the concept and field of DevOps. And now on to demo. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, so before we start demo, uh, I'm not sure if everyone's done this yet. Um, so let's get started by first installing Docker. Um, can everyone do that real quick? Uh, we'll just wait while people finish that up. And then ideally, if you have the time, you can also make an account on Docker Hub, but that's something we'll use on Wednesday. So it's not actually necessary for this lecture. <clears throat> and while people download Docker, um, I know when I took the course, this was like the most confusing um, lecture. I didn't really understand it at all. And I literally just thought of this analogy when Jessica was giving lecture. Um, but images and containers are like the two components of Docker, right? And the way I thought of thinking about it is just like, um, you have the App Store, right? The App Store is equivalent to Docker Hub. When you download apps in the App Store, you're pulling from the Docker Hub. And the image you get 
is like the new app that you just installed. Everyone has the same version of the app when you install it for the first time, right? So the image is like a template. It's like what you initially start working with. And then when you open the app, that's the Docker container. The container is a live instance of your app running. And as a user, you are now then able to like mess around with it and like actually interact with the app. Um, so hopefully that like makes uh, like understanding this a bit more sense um, because I remember what, what like I was really confused when I learned this. So um, yeah. <clears throat> Um, show of hands who's not downloaded Docker yet. Okay, we can still wait some time. Um, and then the environment thing we were talking about, right? The environment is basically the bare minimum you need to run the app, right? So your operating system, your code, your libraries, and environment variables are the bare minimum you need to run your app. So for example, if you're on a phone, right, you need an iPhone OS, you need an iOS, right? That's, otherwise, you can't run um, the apps you want to run. And you need the code that runs behind the app to actually run the app as well, right? Um, and the reason why Docker is so nice is because, for example, on my computer, right, I have Spotify installed and like Google Chrome installed and all this garbage that you don't actually need to run the app. A Docker image contains only the bare minimum to run the app, meaning the operating system and your code and et cetera. Um, which is why it's so like simple and modular. Um, and is easily kind of passed around uh, across developers. That makes sense. Cool. <clears throat> uh, anyone still downloading Docker? Very good. Okay, if you have Docker downloaded, um, try, uh, make sure you open it before you start this demo. Um, so yeah, that's just the last step before we can get started. Okay. <clears throat> We're good. All right, so I will start with demo now. Um, so the first thing we'll do is just open um, our code from demo four. If you don't, if you weren't here for um, last week's demo, you can just go ahead and download the starter code from last week. Um, that only has like the bare, like the hello world endpoint, but that's really all you need because um, we're not actually coding out an app this time. So yeah, open demo for code. Uh, that's this file right here. <laughs> okay, everyone good? All right, let's start. So um, the first thing we need to do to um, actually start like this process of creating um, a Docker container slash image is to create this thing called a Docker file. The Docker file defines how you want to actually run the app. Um, so again, going back to the app store analogy, right? Let's say you want to open um, Facebook or like Instagram or whatever. You as a user shouldn't need to know to run app.py or pip install requirements.txt, right? All you have to do is like tap the icon. In similar fashion, when you have Docker images, the way you run them is by uh, running a command called Docker run. So it kind of like, um, like wh whether you have a Python project or a JavaScript project or a Java project or a TypeScript project, every type of app you run in under Docker, like you can run it with Docker run. So it like kind of modularize, um, modularizes this um, process of running the app, right? Um, <clears throat> so again, let's create our Docker file and this will define how to run our app. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to activate my virtual environment just to check my Python version, but this isn't actually necessary. You don't have to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so um, now we have to now build our Docker image, which is like our template or like our uh, blueprint for running the app, right? But we have to use like a base template. We, we, didn't, we can't make something from like absolute scratch. And a lot of the time, the base template will be the language that you're using. So in our case, that would be Python. Um, to define the base template we're using, we're going to use the from command. So to do that, we type from in all capital case. Also, in this Docker file, uh, make sure your uh, the D in Docker file is capitalized and everything else is lowercase. There's no extensions at all either. So there's no like dot .py. OK. So from um, Python on, and then I'm just going to use a version that I have in my virtual environment, which is 3.9.12. And this is the base image. 
Um, you can actually see the image that exists uh, on Docker Hub itself. So if you go to Docker Hub and you're signed in, you can type in um, Python here to look it up. Um, and you'll see that Python has like its own base image, right? Um, and then if I look up 3.9.12, that is indeed a version that exists. But you don't actually have to know this nitty gritty detail. Um, you can just copy me uh, if you don't understand that part. So for working with our base image of Python 3.9.12, um, the first thing we're going to do is to create a directory for us to like store our files in. This is because a lot of the time when you have um, a computer running some sort of service, you'll have a lot of system files. And you don't actually want that in the same directory as your app files. Uh, system files being like, you know, your, your computer just kind of creates a bunch of files to like make your uh, comp computer run a little smoother. Um, and you want to kind of distinguish that and like the app files that you're running. So we'll first make a directory um, for, for containing our app files, right? All right, so the way we do that is by using the run command. Run just runs a, uh, it runs a terminal command in your um, image, your Docker image. So if let's say I'm, on, I'm in my source folder right now, right? And these are the files in my source folder. Uh, one of the commands that's a terminal command um, that a lot, of our, a lot of you might use in the future is mkdir, which short, uh, stands for make directory. Um, and you followed it up with the directory name that you want to use. So let's say, I'm just gonna call it test, right? If I do mkdir test, then you can see that a new file called test was created. Everyone see that, right? So we're gonna do the same thing here. We'll make a directory called app slash or user slash app in our base directory. And the way we set this directory that we just created as our working directory, i.e. the directory that we're gonna be hosting all our app files in is by typing a command work dear user slash app. <clears throat> and ignore the school day for now, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, then the next thing we want to do is to copy all the files we have in our source folder and move it over to um, this user slash app folder. And the way we do that is just by doing copy, the copy command. And this takes in two inputs, the first being everything you want to copy, and then the second being um, where you want to copy it to. So everything I want to copy is in my current directory, so I'll just type dot. And then the directory I want to store all those files in it is also the current directory, because I set the working directory to be user.app earlier, so it's just another dot. <clears throat> Okay, so this is actually all of our setup that we need. Um, in the Docker image, we're basically um, in the source folder, but like the Docker image version of it. So to run our app from, um, right, from like a, to, to run our app, we have to first install our requirements, right? That's the first thing we did uh, in demo one. So we'll use another run command and type pip three install dash r requirements.txt. And then once we've installed all our requirements, all we have to do is run the, run the Python file, right? Which is app.py. Um, you might think that you would use a run command here, but that's actually not the case. Um, the command you use to run your actual app or run your actual ser server <clears throat> is the CMD command. Uh, and you can only have one CMD command in your Docker file. That determines what file you want to be running when you actually call this Docker file. So cmd python3 app.py. <clears throat> so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so this is everything that's going to be in our Docker file. And if let's say we're not using like Python, right? And we're using like say TypeScript instead. And our inst um, <clears throat> our installment steps are like npm install and then like npm run then like that would go in here as well so the docker file determines or de defines how to run the steps individually and then once we actually define that we don't have to memorize these commands ourselves we can just run docker run and it'll run the app smoothly cool <clears throat> so now let's build our base image right our image um i.e our app right like the the template version of our app um so the way we do that is by typing docker build 
dot. And the dot is saying, uh, the current directory is where my Docker file is. So I'll do that. <clears throat> and I think this might take a bit longer um, for you guys to run it. Um, I already have Python installed. Um, like I loaded the Python image previously, so it's like cached in my system, but it's okay if um, this takes a little longer to, to um, build for you guys. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna demonstrate how to see all the images that we've built. So we just built an image, right, from the current directory that we're currently in. The way we check what images exist is by typing Docker images. Okay, wait, let me just um, delete this image from earlier. Oh. Oh, Docker. Uh, image? image? Okay. Um, whatever. This is the one that we currently have. So let's just look at, well, let's just focus on that. Um, the one that was created 49 seconds ago. <clears throat> so is everyone done building their Docker image? Show of hands for those who aren't done. Okay, we can wait a little longer. <clears throat> Any questions about how Docker works? Uh, yeah. That's just like what we arbitrarily chose. Um, it doesn't actually really matter what we call it. But again, um, in any given you know, image or like computer, right? Um, a lot of the time the computer will make system files, right? Files so that your computer runs smoother in the base directory, in the very root directory that you're in, which is where your default directory starts at. So we just called, made a uh, folder called user slash app um, to like store all of our app.py and db.py in so that it doesn't actually get like mixed up with all the system files. Uh, so that doesn't really matter what you call it. You can call it whatever you want, but yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, anyone's still building? Okay, that's okay. Um, I'll still demonstrate the max command, but it's still gonna be a Docker build command, so don't worry. Uh, so one thing you might've noticed is that in the Docker image that I just built, I have no repository name and I also have no tag, right? I just have an image ID. Um, and this image ID is like, you know, not very, not something that's like very easy to memorize. So a lot of the time we're gonna want to define a repository name or like an image name to, you know, associate to each of our images um, so that we can better identify what each of the images are. Um, so the way we're gonna do that is by typing Docker build dash T, <clears throat> T for tag. And then um, we'll, we'll put the name of the repository. So when you actually make a Docker file for PA5, um, you have to prepend your username to it. So like my username on Docker Hub is snajima. Um, so when I build it, I have to type snajima slash some sort of name. Otherwise, it's not going to upload on Docker Hub, so be careful of that. Um, that's just one thing to take note of. But yeah, let's just, um, so I'm just going to do snajima and then um, demo six, or no, five, um, to add as my repository name. And I still have to define where uh, I'm building this Docker image from. So that's, again, the current directory, hence the dot. And now if I do Docker images, you can see that um, the image that I just created three minutes ago has been replaced with the name um, Snajima Demo 5. Okay. This tag thing is also pretty interesting. Um, so a lot of the time when you're working on a project or working on an app, you'll have multiple versions, right? Uh, as you work throughout like the process of this development stage. So this is like the latest version of my Demo 5. But let's say I have like a version one and like a version two that I want to distinguish. Right. Uh, if you're doing something like that, when you Docker build it, you can add a colon at the end of um, your repository name and type your tag name. So if I do like v1.0.0, right? And again, that's the command. Colon and then the tag name, tag, uh, tag, tag name. 
Uh, if you do Docker images, um, you can see that a version 1.0.0 has been created. And if I build a version 0.0.1, right, then like a new version has been created. So if you don't define a tag, the latest will be um, used by default, but otherwise you can actually define the versions that you're working on um, to better keep track of like the application, that, uh, the process of the application that you're working on. Um, cool, is everyone like done kind of playing around with building Docker images? Everything makes sense so far? Yeah? Amazing, okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so now that we have these Docker images, right, let's actually run them, right? Again, going back to the analogy, right? The way we run an app on our phones is just by tapping them. The way we run a Docker image is just by typing Docker run. And then um, the repository name. Um, so when you run a Docker image, um, unfortunately, this is a bit cumbersome and something that you have to remember. But you have to uh, you have to take note of what port you're running um, the Docker file in. So in app.py, <clears throat> note how every time we ran app.py, it ran on uh, port 8000, right? So that's why you were hitting localhost 8000. Um, we have to define um, actually define what port to be running our Docker image in as well. So the way we do that is by typing this uh, the flag dash p for port. And then we map the port 8000, which is the port number in our Docker image to port 8000 on our computer. So if let's say this was 7000, then the first value will be replaced with 7000 because the image um, port number will be 7000. And then 8000 is a port we're trying to actually access on our computers. And then we'll type slash IT for interactable. This way the terminal um, in the Docker image becomes interactable. And then the repository name, so snjima demo file. Okay. So I'm gonna leave this command up here, but we've just run our first Docker image. Amazing. <clears throat> um, anyone still copying down this command? You good? Okay, so you can you can see here that now like something seems to be running, right? Is this looks really similar um, to what is outputted when we run app.py? Uh, and in fact, it is. So let's go to Postman and try to hit our one of like our demo four endpoints, right? Let's say get all tasks. If we hit send, you can see that you know it's running the app just like we went, uh, just like it was running when we ran app.py, right? So our um, Docker image, which is the template, has successfully been converted to a Docker container and is now running. Um, okay, cool. Also, one quick thing I forgot to mention is before you build your Docker image, um, we want to prepare our production, our code to be production ready, right? So this means deleting our virtual environment like we do with our submissions of like the uh, homework, um, deleting PyCache, and so on. So I forgot to do that. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. I'm gonna delete all of these. All right, and like, let's build the Docker um, image again, or yeah. So we have a version 1.0.1. We want to update this with version 1.0.2, which is like a clean version. So let's do that. <clears throat> And now we actually have a very clean version with containing only app.py, db.py, our Docker file, and requirements.txt. Um, so we'll run that instead. Version 0.2. And you can see that now the database is all cleared. We have like a blank slate to work with. Um, and yeah, now like, so this, this image right here, I'm able to like share with you guys and you guys would be able to download it. And instead of having to memorize pip install and app.py or like Python app.py, you would just Docker run it, right? And again, the reason why that becomes so convenient is because if say I'm working in a different language or a different um, framework or a different package, then you wouldn't have to remember the setup steps. All you would have to do is run Docker run.
Okay. Uh, any questions? That makes sense. Cool. So um, the next thing that actually, I don't know if you have time for that. Okay, let's just do it. Um, so the next thing we're going to cover is the Docker Compose thing that Jessica mentioned during lecture. Um, Docker Compose makes this step even easier. So right now we're running Docker um, run, defining our ports, defining that it's interactable, and then defining our repository name, right? Like, yes, this is easier than having to remember setup stuff for individual apps, but it's still kind of a lot. So we can even more, like, modularize this even more. Um, by using Docker Compose. So Docker Compose tells us how we can run individual images on what port and what kind of configuration. Um, and some apps, like Jessica mentioned, have multiple images in it. So let's say Google Maps for an example, right? Google Maps has a calculator, right? That like def um, determines how long it would take between two locations. It has like some sort of map view that like displays the map to you, right? It has bus information that it would have to like pull from a separate API. It has all these services that's running at the same time. Um, and in the industry, you would want to kind of have all of these different compartments in different images to like kind of segment them out. And when, when something messes, like breaks, right, you can qu quickly identify which part of the app broke. Um, and so that would be an example of when you would use multiple Docker images, right, in, sing in a singular app. Um, for the scope of this class, we're only going to be using one image. But in a Docker Compose file, you can define as many images as you want in any configuration as you want. Um, and instead of running docker run dash p blah, 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 it'll be an easy, even simpler command. Um, so I'm just going to make a docker compose.yaml file. Docker, again, that's docker slash compose or dash compose.yaml, yml. And this is going to be where we define which images to run on what port and all sorts of other configurations. Um, but we're running a bit low on time, so we'll start the Kahoot uh, for today. Let's just end it with an empty Docker Compose file for today. Um, yeah. So any questions before we move on to the Kahoot? Hopefully I wasn't going too fast. Hopefully that made a bit of sense. Um, okay.